today on Mother Mayhem. You're going to want to pay attention to if drinking is starting to become a bit of a secret for you. If you're buying alcohol and you're hiding it or you're covering up your purchases, if you notice yourself taking steps to cover your tracks, at the very least, you're telling yourself that you're choosing a behavior that feels shameful. But at its worst, this is an indicator that drinking has become a more serious problem for you and you're really going to want to pay attention. Welcome back to Mother Mayhem, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Podcast for Daughters. Hi, I'm your host, Heather Gray, and we owe today's really important conversation to the bravery of one listener, Dorothy, who you first met in last week's episode when we were talking about fathers who enable narcissistic mothers. As we talked about, That is a sucker punch that many of you are continuing to live with every day, and it's only intensifying the trauma that you're experiencing. Now, Dorothy was honest with us when she shared that one of the ways that she ends up managing her feelings is with alcohol, and she was looking for support in stopping that. Here's how she put it for us. Another area of interest related to trauma and not feeling attached, loved as a kid is how addiction plays into it. I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that I have struggled with addiction most of my life, especially alcohol. I've been successful professionally and feel that I live a good life, but there are patterns for sure. And I think that this is often a problem with many people who have had traumatic or abusive childhoods. First, Dorothy, I really want to honor and respect your bravery. In bringing this conversation to light, you're going to be helping so many other women in this exact same struggle. Addiction, dependency, and dysfunctional coping mechanisms, they all bring so much shame, don't they? And sometimes we just like to hide them in the dark and let them be our own dirty little secrets. I follow the work of Brene Brown, and she often, so often says to us that shame cannot exist in the light. So by saying this truth out loud, clearly and directly, you're minimizing the impact that shame might have on your ability to heal and overcome, and you're helping other women do the exact same thing. I want you and all of the other women listening to this along with you, Dorothy, to remember a core tenet of trauma work that you've heard me say before. Normal behaviors and response to abnormal events are normal reactions. I've said it before, and you're going to hear me say it again, but it is normal after a childhood impacted by emotional abuse and abandonment that you would search for things to ease the pain, numb the pain, or eliminate the pain altogether. That is a normal response, and I understand how you got here. And while I don't think I can solve the problems of addiction or dependency in a single podcast episode, I do think I might be able to offer you a frame for how you might approach recovery so that you feel more in control of your own actions and your own reactions. So let's start first by understanding how you got here. It's not uncommon for individuals who've experienced traumatic and abusive childhoods, particularly ones with disrupted attachment or emotional neglect. It's not unexpected that you all are going to struggle with addiction or some sort of chemical dependency later in life. And we know that from our previous conversations, emotional neglect and abandonment creates this disrupted attachment. You're left with emotional wounds and a sense of emptiness that you were never provided the tools to deal with. At some point, some of you, and you might have been quite young even, you realize that your emotional pain decreases with alcohol use or substance use. For some, You might have found comfort in food, or you might have found comfort in sex. Others of you might have found relief in some form of self-harm, like cutting or burning yourselves. And if you think about it, 
all of that makes sense because all of you have been programmed from a really early age not to be in the way, to be super responsible, to not be difficult, to not make waves, and to not react to things. Drinking and those other behaviors, they allow you to keep doing those things without really impacting or affecting anyone else. So you could have a drink, numb yourself, and then no one would be inconvenienced by your feelings or your hard time. Alcohol and these other things might have made you able to deal with your life without having to make anyone in your life change what they were doing. You just have a drink and whatever pain you're feeling becomes more bearable. We know too that disrupted attachment during childhood often can lead to difficulties in forming those healthy relationships and trusting others. And this ends up paving the way for alcohol to serve as that substitute for emotional connection or intimacy. It sometimes can be that crutch that gives you confidence in situations where you find yourself lacking it. It can be that great connector if you're feeling isolated or different from anyone. And at any point in time, alcohol can seemingly work to make the hard parts of your life easier to deal with and make you yourself feel like you're less in the way. Alcohol and other behaviors give you this temporary escape from negative emotions. That can provide its own sense of relief or its own sense of pleasure. But additionally, I gotta tell you, trauma rarely exists in its own in a, inside a vacuum, right? Depression, anxiety, PTSD or CPTSD, they're often riding shotgun alongside the trauma. So alcohol is unfortunately a common way that people will opt to self-medicate themselves or manage themselves through difficult feelings or difficult experiences. What I often see in my practice is untreated trauma. So your experiences of your mother, your childhood history, likely a lot of that went unaddressed or ignored for quite a while. So it's not uncommon for me to hear from women that I'm not their first therapist, but that I am the first one who's helped them make sense of the root of the problem. Sometimes working with me, this is the first time that they've had the conversation about their mother wounds and their childhood trauma. And for many of you listening to the show, I imagine that that might be true for you too. So if you've never considered the role of childhood trauma in your life, or if another sort of professional has erroneously skipped over it, then you have likely developed addiction, dependency, or reliance on alcohol because of this psychobabble thing that people call pattern repetition. What that means is that your unresolved trauma can lead to a repetition of these unhealthy coping mechanisms in adulthood. So if substances provided this temporary relief for you during difficult times in your past, you're going to end up finding yourself relying on them in other situations. And also, too, we know trauma changes our brains. One of the ways that it, it can impact the brain is that it changes or alters in a way how your brain receives or interprets pleasure or rewards. So this is going to make you more vulnerable to addiction as you're trying to access that reward center of your brain that trauma has impacted or somehow compromised. And we know that the narcissistic mother wound cuts deep, and it affects so many areas of your life. You might experience this in a disconnected relationship with yourself. You might be experiencing hypervigilance. We heard that last week. Low self-esteem or difficulty in relationships with other people. And all of these struggles are ripe for alcohol dependency to make an appearance. It makes sense to me. Dorothy, you're already identifying for us that your relationship with alcohol is uncomfortable for you and it's become problematic. Others listening in may just now be having this conversation with themselves 
and they may be feeling fear as they self-identify with your situation too. If any of you are questioning the role that alcohol or another problem behavior has in your life, here's what you should be asking yourself and considering. If you find the frequency with which you are drinking to be increasing, it's worth noting. For example, in my own house, I tend to not drink on school nights, even though I'm long out of school and I don't have kids. So that might change on vacation or on some random nights, but it would be notable to me if I had a random drink on a random Wednesday. If your drinking has become regular and at a predictable level, and yet you find yourself drinking a larger quantity or you're drinking more days of the week than normal, it's going to be worth taking a moment to reflect on this and why you think that might be and the role that alcohol has in your life. Before I go any further, I want to assure all of you, I should have probably said this at the beginning of the episode, that I've created a companion guide for this episode so that you can use it. It's going to be this attachment that you're going to see of journaling prompts, a frame for how to think about this, as well as a list of coping strategies. You're going to hopefully be able to use this to organize your thinking and feelings about all of this. I find that conversations like this can be really intense and overwhelming, and structure can be this important container for all of this heart that you're holding. So definitely check out the the guide. It's going to be in the show notes and you'll find that document. It's going to offer you the frame and it's also going to include some coping mechanisms. When I work on women and they're drinking, one of the things that I ask them is a little bit to reflect on what you were thinking and feeling before you drink. What was your day like beforehand? What were your previous days like beforehand? What were you thinking about and feeling? And I ask these women to chase the tail a little bit. When they go back and they chase that tail for that drink, where did it start? How far back are they going? One drink isn't a problem per se, But I think any time we're using a substance to replace a feeling or to stop a feeling, it's worth considering. And again, it's not always substances. Sometimes it's other behaviors. Those of you who struggle with emotional eating, ding, 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 raising my hand here, you're going to benefit from an exercise like this too, because it really does work for any problem behavior. What I'm actually doing here is the psychobabble term for it is classic cognitive behavioral therapy, right? CBT for short. It means what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What did you do? How did it make you feel? And did you try to do anything else to feel better before you did that? What do you wish you did instead? It's these prompts and ways of walking through an episode where you chose a dysfunctional behavior or chose to drink and helps you understand your behavioral pattern, your responses, your triggers, your thoughts, and your feelings. Learning your own behavioral cycle is actually going to help you make more sense to yourself. You'll start to see those patterns. You are going to identify triggers and find those sticky situations And reflecting on this is going to help you identify the tools for your toolbox that work for you, that help you decrease the behavior or maybe even stop it altogether. Another way to help you see is if this is becoming a problem for you is if you notice your tolerance for alcohol is increasing. If you need more alcohol to get the same effect that you used to get with less alcohol, it's a really good indicator that you might be in that danger zone. And it's also worth looking to see if you find yourself thinking about alcohol more often. If you're telling yourself at 10 o'clock in the morning that you just have to get through the next six hours and then it's wine o'clock, as they like to say on Pinterest and social media, it's a good indicator that you are relying on alcohol in lieu of other coping strategies. We can turn this inside out. And if you're telling yourself at noon that you're not going to drink tonight, that you're going to go to the gym, that you're going to call a friend, that you're going to catch up on a show, and then you find yourself drinking even after you promised yourself that you wouldn't, 
it's likely that you're going to need a more targeted approach to decreasing drinking in your life. You're going to want to pay attention to if drinking is starting to become a bit of a secret for you. If you're buying alcohol and you're hiding it or you're covering up your purchases, if you notice yourself taking steps to cover your tracks, at the very least, you're telling yourself that you're choosing a behavior that feels shameful. But at its worst, this is an indicator that drinking has become a more serious problem for you and you're really going to want to pay attention. This is a lot, and this is a lot of pain here that we're talking about. And acknowledging that your pain has led to choices and behaviors that no longer feel good for you or that are starting to have a negative impact on you, it isn't easy. And it can be really hard to hear these truths out loud. It would be so easy just to be able to turn me off and say, this doesn't apply to me. But just take a deep breath here. Keep breathing your way through it as I outline a care plan and a response plan. Before we got started, I want to be clear here. I am walking you through an alcohol recovery plan, using it as a frame for how I think about it and approach it. Over the years, I'm sure you have run into so many different approaches and ways of thinking about it and responding to it. My core belief in all of this is that you need to have a buy-in for whatever approach you choose. If you hear me out, and this sounds like nonsense, this plan is not going to work for you. You would be better off looking at how other people approach it and try their methods. It's like dieting. And so for me, I'm a Weight Watchers girl. I've tried Atkins, I've tried keto, I've done intermittent fasting and others, but for me, Weight Watchers makes sense and it works. I don't have buy-in to the other ones, so they don't work for me. And telling you this, <laughs> I have to be honest, guys, it's making me actually laugh a little bit. At one point, I tried the Noom app, N-O-O-M. <laughs> And let me just tell you that once the app told me to have a noom tastic day for the umpteenth time and I found myself yelling back at the phone, fuck you, <laughs> it was pretty clear that I didn't have buy-in. So this is all to say that if you are listening to me lay out this plan and you find yourself telling me to fuck off, my plan here might not be the right one for you, and that is totally okay. What's most important is that you're already identifying that this is a problem you see for yourself and you're seeking a solution. That is what matters. So here goes. I'm going to offer the plan and then the coping mechanisms that can assist with making the plan manageable and tolerable. I'm going to include all of this in that document that I'm going to create for this episode. So for now, all you have to do is listen. You can take notes if you want to, but everything's going to be in the doc. The first part of the plan, you're going to want to think about goal setting. This is about getting crystal clear with yourself about what your goal is. Now, I'm going to tell you my belief and my bias that the best course of action when you are identifying a reliance on alcohol, another substance, or another behavior is that you stop drinking altogether. I find that there's too many mental games that can be played and there's too much preoccupation with drinking or how many drinks you're going to have or how often you're going to allow yourself to have them that end up giving alcohol way too much presence and power in your life when you simply try to decrease or quote-unquote monitor your drinking. That being said, I've had clients who have been crystal clear with me that they are not willing to live sober lives, and for them, I ask them to decide what amount of drinking feels good for them, what feels like healthy control, and I encourage them to choose that. What are some of your long and short-term goals that you have for the role of alcohol in your life? What other goals might you have for your overall physical health, 
or your mental well-being. Now, it's totally okay, obviously, if addressing alcohol is your only goal. That is a big goal, and you may only be able to tackle that one thing, but you just want to make sure your goals are specific, measurable, and observable, so you know when you meet them. You're going to want to consider getting professional help. You are so used to taking on everything and doing it yourself, and you are used to making yourself the answer to every question. It can be hard to admit to someone outside of your circle that you're struggling. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to overcome, but sharing your burden with a trained professional who can be the expert on it for you will take the pressure off of you so you can actually focus on your own healing. Consider getting a therapist, joining a support group, connecting with AA, or joining an online community dedicated to helping you have a better relationship with alcohol. Professional help, it also helps you get to the root of the problem. For those of you listening, the root of this problem, more often than not, is going to be childhood trauma recovery, narcissistic abuse recovery, CPTSD recovery, likely a combination of all of the above. But if you do the work to heal your trauma and rewrite your narrative, the desire to drink and self-medicate will decrease because you're going to feel more empowered to manage your own feelings instead of feeling like you have to numb them. You are going to want to find your people, your support network. Who are your people? Who can you share this with? Who will root for you without judging? Who can you falter in front of? The shame of alcohol dependency or other poor coping mechanisms, it often keeps people private and isolated. But the evidence shows that support and encouragement go a long way in healing and recovery. Without it, you're in this echo chamber of your own thoughts, correcting your own thinking errors, and it's really hard to do on your own. So you're going to want to start collecting coping mechanisms. Any tools or strategies that have worked for you in the past, make note of them. As you collect new things that work, make note of those too. In moments of indecision, when you're tempted to drink, it's going to be hard to recall that other things besides alcohol actually work. So it's going to help you to have a concrete list of things that do help and have helped you. That kind of list could be invaluable in getting you to decrease your drinking or not drink altogether. And as you've listened to this show for a while, you may have already collected some tools and strategies that have started to work from you that you've learned here. So after I walk you through this frame, I'm going to be offering a list of additional ones that you might want to try. But absolutely, alternative coping mechanisms are going to be crucial to your recovery. You have been drinking to cope with mad, sad, scared feelings and you have been living with these feelings your entire life. If we don't start listing out and making alternative coping strategies accessible to you and easy to identify and reach, in those moments of feeling mad, sad, and scared, you're only going to end up wanting to drink more. You're also going to want to look at your lifestyle. Are there certain places or situations that trigger or instigate your drinking behavior? What do you need to start avoiding in order to be more successful? You may need to avoid situations with drinking altogether, at least until you get your feet under you and feel like you have a handle on the problem. You're also going to want to consider getting physical. (laughs) Okay, now admittedly, I just said that and rolled my eyes as I said it, but trauma recovery It really does involve so much freaking head work. You can be in your feelings and in your thoughts and your body reactions all the goddamn time. And so sometimes your only awareness of your body is when it gets dysregulated. So you start to see your body as part of the problem. It may even become your enemy in a way. 
And of course, in this psychobabble predictable way, I'm going to remind you that exercise helps with all of those feel good hormones in the brain. But also, I'm going to tell you, getting physical gets you out of your head altogether. For me, I have to tell you, I freaking love boxing. <laughs> if you've been listening to me for a while, you might have a hard time believing that I've boxed in my past, but it totally gets me out of my head. It changes the story of who I am, what I'm capable of, and it has been such a healthy release for me in my own life. I also really love those HIIT workouts, the high-intensity interval training, and I've really gotten into strength training too. I work out like five days a week or so to YouTube videos, and I tend to alternate the HIIT workouts with the strength, and I really credit that to my emotional well-being. When I falter and I find myself feeling disorganized or depressed or stressed, I often can chase that tail and realize that I've stopped working out as regularly. So finding a physical activity that engages your mind, distracts you, and helps you connect with other like-minded people, it's a really good recovery tool. Since I'm going to be such a buzzkill, pun intended, I might as well add while I'm talking here, pay attention to diet. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> I'm such a nag today, but let's get honest here. When we're, ta when we're taking good care of our bodies on the inside and we are working out regularly, we are less likely to want to ruin it by drinking. But also, though, a healthy diet and that good exercise, the combination helps balance us out and it allows for our moods to stabilize. So I got to tell you, I am a donut girl. I am a French fry girl. I'm the Weight Watchers girl. So it really does pain me to say it. But when you are working on getting mentally stronger, a healthy diet is going to enable you and get you so much further than those gosh darn french fries and donuts do. You're also going to want to make a trigger plan. You are going to want to get ahead of tricky and dicey situations by planning for them. If you know that something's going to be hard for you to manage without alcohol, question whether or not you really actually need to go. And if you do need to go, who can you text or who can you check in with or what can you do instead? I also would suggest, and people laugh at me when I say this, but make a plan for what you're going to drink instead. I can't tell you how many sober people I know that just have tonic water and lime. Unless you really like tonic water, that to me seems like punishing yourself for having a sober life. We're living in a time when people are becoming more and more sober curious, more and more sober aware. So a lot of places they're going to offer a mocktail. Allow yourself a mocktail. Bring your own fresh squeezed juice and ask for some Sprite in it or ask for a ginger beer with lime. You might find that there's nothing you want more than that drink, but at least give yourself your best shot by offering yourself something more enjoyable than plain old tonic water. Ask yourself in general before these tricky, sticky events, what do I need to get through this situation sober? And allow yourself to have it. Ask for help. Accept help. This next one, none of you are going to like, but you all have to plan for relapse. I honestly, gosh, I, I wish I could just shout this from the rooftops. I'm recovering from a sinus infection and my voice is going as I record as it is, so I'm not going to shout. But you all have to know, relapse is part of recovery. I'm going to say that one again since I can't shout from the rooftops. Relapse is part of recovery. Sometimes you can only learn your triggers or your soft spots when you falter. Relapse isn't failure. It's part of the process. So you want to learn from it. You want to chase the tail. You want to look at the contributing factors and where you could have taken a right instead of a left. What did you try? What didn't you try? What worked? What didn't? Relapse offers so much data, so be willing to reflect on it 
and ask yourself those hard questions. You're also, while trying to get sober or drink less, you are going to have to plan on letting other things go. If you stop drinking, you might start eating. You might start binging trash TV or sleeping more. You might stop cleaning the house or distance yourself from people. Your desire to be perfect in recovery will likely outlast common sense. I have seen that be true over and over again. So if a friend of yours was trying to get sober, how much would you be expecting of her? If your younger self were trying to get sober and take better care of herself, how much would you be asking of her? How much would you want her to lower her own expectations of herself and hold yourself to that same standard? Once you get your feet under you and you collect a period of sobriety, whatever that looks like for you, you can get back to meeting all your other expectations. But for now, one thing at a time, one day at a time, it is a mantra in AA for a reason. I want you to think about celebrating the wins, the big wins, the small wins, collect the days, collect the weeks, collect the months of sobriety. Make note of the times that you wanted to drink but didn't. Make note of the times that you thought you would falter but you didn't. Catch yourself when you're being good and notice it. So often we harp on our failures and we dwell on them. Dwell on your wins with that same intensity. Write them down. Make them visible. Alcohol hasn't really been a concern for me in, your, in my life, but my problem with my weight, emotional eating, I am so there. And during the pandemic, I knew that that scale of mine was going to go up or it was going to go down. So I logged every workout I did every day. I logged into the Weight Watchers app and I got myself a small gem or a token every time I lost five pounds. And I have a little collection of these stones on my desk to remind myself of the achievement. And it stays out even when I gain a few pounds back or I have to get back on the wagon. There are so many other things that I could, could be and probably should be including in what makes a solid recovery plan. But for now, I'm going to let it be here. I probably should have led with this another thing, hindsight 2020, but I don't have a specialty in alcohol or substance abuse. Most people who struggle with addiction struggle because of trauma, so I really do try to keep myself well-versed in current methods and modalities, but I am always going to suggest that if you're struggling with the use of alcohol in your life or another substance or another problematic behavior, do consider getting yourself the help of a more qualified expert, especially if these things I'm suggesting don't work or don't offer relief. Again, I have all of this spelled out for you in the doc that I'm going to link to in the show notes. So if you missed anything or whatever, you'll have it there as well. But for now, I want to offer you some coping strategies. Because if you're not going to drink, you're going to have to learn alternative ways of coping with all of the mad, sad, and scared feelings you have. I'd like to think that this podcast has already outlined a lot of different coping skills for managing hard feelings that you can use instead of drinking. But I also know that a drinking problem can often feel even bigger than all of that. Obviously, anything I've said in previous episodes about coping or calming your body, all of them are going to work here. But let me also make a little list for you just to help you as you're navigating all of this. So the first thing I want you to think about considering is mindfulness, meditation, and or visualization exercises. All of these can be really, really helpful when you're trying to stay focused, on task, and calm during really stressful times. It's not my observation that these things are one-size-fits-all kind of things. I myself don't at all do well with silent meditation. <laughs> 
I am far better when doing guided meditations. I like the feeling of someone looking out for me and doing the planning and the thinking about it so I don't have to. And I really like deep breathing exercises too. Like any of the coping strategies, you want to be open to trial and error and staying curious about yourself. If something doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you, and that's okay. All you have to do is a search for meditation or mindfulness exercises, and a whole plethora of them are going to come up for you. And remember what I just finished saying earlier about getting physical. So many of your feelings don't actually need to be processed or analyzed. You just need to get them out of your body. If you know the book, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, uh, I just butchered his name. You know what I'm talking about. It talked about how trauma is stored in the body. You feel something, and for whatever reason, you weren't able to deal with it in the moment. Maybe you had to shove it down out of self-protection. Maybe your mom would have weaponized it in some way. Maybe you were focusing too much on her and not enough on yourself. But whatever the reason, you're likely in a habit of not seeing your feelings through. So they just end up getting stored in your body. Physical activity can release them without having to process them. Back in 2015, I was boxing six days a week. My husband was really sick that year. He was in and out of hospitals from March until November. How many times does somebody get to say, well, this is really hard. It's really scary and sucky that my husband is still so sick. How much could I say about it? How much could I talk about it? How often can I say caregiving fucking sucks? I didn't always need to process the suck and the stuck and the fear. I just needed to release it. So I punched it out on a boxing bag. I did Tabata on some other days when I wasn't boxing. In recent years, I got into strength training. Whatever your thing is, find it. Give yourself permission to do it. And again, in 2015, my husband was in and out of the ICU. He was out of the house at one point for six weeks recovering from a surgery in a rehab center. I still went boxing. And when classes didn't fit my schedule, I ask for private lessons. Be unapologetic about finding alternatives to drinking. Taking care of yourself matters. Giving yourself permission to take care of yourself, watching yourself invest in your wellness and your recovery, that is going to undo so much damage done by your narcissistic mom. So get moving. Find your thing and you will find your swing. <laughs> How about that? I am so gosh darn cheesy sometimes. But I also like the idea of creative tools. I'm not a songwriter, but I am obsessed with lyrics and story songs. The perfect lyric always seems to heal me. I also like pictures of close-up photography. I have a whole folder on my phone of flower close-ups. You might find that you enjoy crafting or needlework. You might like writing. I don't mind saying and sharing that doing this podcast has lit me up creatively in ways that I've never expected. Again, your feelings, they just need to be released. They don't always need to be processed through words. So release them in whatever creative outlet moves you. Now, admittedly, I'm going to be the first one to say... <laughs> This is something I know next to nothing about, but it might be worth looking into body work or progressive muscle relaxation. You might consider assisted stretching, Reiki massage, acupuncture, trauma-informed yoga practices. I'm not at all well-versed in these things, but I, I know enough to know that if it sparks something in you when I say it, Give yourself permission to be curious about it. Look around in the body work space and the healing space. See what you might find, and perhaps you're going to find something that works for you. Don't forget to the power of nature. Open air, the woods, 
mountains, water. Get yourself outside whenever possible. It's grounding, it's healing, it's restorative. This next one is always a little tricky when I talk about it, but I want you to consider trying random acts of kindness or volunteering. And admittedly, it feels a little bit dangerous to say this to a group of women who likely struggle with perfectionism and people pleasing and all those things. But this is something that I use a lot when I'm working with women who have what we would call treatment resistant depression. I often suggest to women that it might help them to stop focusing on themselves altogether, to stop thinking about their misery, stop thinking about their trauma, and focus on other people. It's actually a clinically-based research intervention. I'm not making this shit up, I promise. And again, like you're going to have to probably do a dance or walk the fine line because a lot of you struggle with so much people pleasing and so much perfectionism that like doing random acts of kindness is only going to make the problem worse. But if you find yourself not being able to get out of your own way and you can't think about something other than drinking, maybe you start thinking about how you can help someone instead. Obviously, you want to be careful. You don't want to make too much of a time commitment or a financial commitment But my observation really is that a few good deeds a week often can change our stories of who we are, what we're capable of, also while it cements who we want to be instead. I want you two to remember to keep your friends close and closer still. I mentioned earlier how important it is to have a support network. But I actually think that having a circle of friends who has your back, who you can share anything with, and be unapologetic with, it's everything. Friendship might be something that's hard for a lot of you, because for many daughters of narcissistic mothers, you can struggle with peers. It can be hard to know how to have friends, how to hold them, how to keep them close how to let them know how they can help you, how to let them help you, and how you can let them help you focus on getting on the right track. All of that can feel so vulnerable and weird and entirely a little too soft. But nurturing those relationships and watering them so that they grow and give back to you, that is going to pay off in dividends in your emotional wellness banking account. So spend some time thinking about the friends who take care of you and nurture those relationships right back. When we're talking about alcohol dependency, I also really like talking about journaling. I think it's important to write it out, to vent it out, to get it out. And there are so many kinds of journals and ways of adding a journal practice to your life So do some looking around and see ways that other people are journaling and how they're using journaling. See if any of those resonate for you. I like offering journaling prompts. So as a result, I find myself, I like being offered journaling prompts. You might find that you prefer a more free thinking style. Whatever works for you is going to work. And don't forget the power that comes with deep breathing. I've gone on about this one on the show a lot, and I'm not going to say too much more here, but I would really, really encourage you to do a search about ways that people incorporate deep breathing into their lives. See which ones you might have buy-in into and give those a shot. You're not going to want to forget about therapy or professional help. I've already said this several times. You're going to hear me say it several more. But I really do think of it as a critical to your recovery plan and your prevention plan, but also to regular meetings with a therapist or a group. They're also a coping strategy. And sometimes when the urge to drink is like really intense, you forget that you could just go to therapy, especially if you already have an established relationship with someone. It's so easy to forget that sometimes a therapy session is all you need. Or you don't think you want to go because you're feeling bad that you've been drinking or have been triggered to drink. And you're really going to want to work on getting out of your own way about that, remembering that relapse is part of recovery. 
but if you have someone professional that you already know and that you've already connected with, a really good coping strategy is always going to be to schedule some time with them. This next one, you're going to want to check in with yourself here about what self-care means to you, how you're doing with your own self-care. This is such a loaded one because I think we all send each other to the spa every single time we talk about self-care. And so if you are the Manny Petty girl and it hasn't been a while, go get yourself a Manny Petty. Um, if you do prefer to be well manicured or groomed and that's your idea of self-care, go get yourself that facial or give yourself a facial at home. Get yourself that intensive hair and conditioning treatment. But also, too, maybe you instead schedule a morning when you sleep in. Maybe you're making sure that you're stocked on all of your other creature comforts aside from alcohol. So you're making sure that you have really good coffee available. Your favorite tea, perhaps a lotion or a perfume or a body wash. Maybe you like candlelight or, or bass or candlelight and bass, whatever floats your rubber ducky. <laughs> a huge part of my own self-care, it's this curated playlist that I have on Spotify. Maybe you let me know if you want this playlist. I don't know. I've, I've wondered if I should do one for the show, but... I have this Heather Made Me Listen playlist that I subject my friends and family to. So perhaps I'm going to invite all of you to listen to. But it comes with a huge ass warning because I like country music. And I know that isn't for everyone. But this is your reminder that self-care looks different for everyone. And so if it's music, find your music. Get yourself your playlist. It doesn't have to be mine. Me... Self-care for me is also the most perfect bedding, the perfect sheets, the perfect pillow. I make my coffee from this crazy, stupid, expensive coffee machine that I decided was too expensive, but my husband gifted me for Christmas. And I treat myself to coffee from really special places on days when I need an extra boost. So the special coffee only comes out on the days I need that special boost. Otherwise, it's just regular old plain old coffee for me. I talked earlier about when my husband was sick in 2015. And ever since then, he tires really easily. So often, most nights, we're in bed by nine. That is way earlier than I would prefer on any night. So on weekends, he goes to bed with the dog and I stay up and I watch my collection of shows that only interest me. And I consider that one of my most favorite things of self-care. I like farmer's markets. So I go to one every single week. None of these may be your idea of self-care and that is totally okay. But I want you to start getting curious about what you do consider self-care and then I want to start getting you to this place where you let yourself have it. I also want you to pick a mantra. Aren't we all kind of suckers for these like quick quotables where we pick something and it motivates us or inspires us? Is there one that you have that kind of sticks out above the rest? Keep a collection of them or the ones that you like and, and make them easily accessible to you. If you have one that's this particular guiding light for you, if it's one that really moves you and drives you, put it as the screensaver on your phone. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Put it on your nightstand, on your refrigerator, on your desktop. Surround yourself with that sentiment of the feelings, of the things you want to be thinking about yourself and how you want to be thinking about your life. I don't want you to forget either that your boundaries are a coping strategy too. You're not going to be as driven to drink if you're protecting your limits and your boundaries. I've done a whole show on this in the past and it's come up in other episodes too. So I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole talking about this. But I would encourage you to check in with yourself about your boundaries. See if they need adjusting. Give them attention especially if you're finding yourself more triggered to drink because so-and-so keeps doing this or so-and-so keeps doing that, you might need a, a little boundary refresh. Puzzles and games can be 
really great distractors. You can pick up a jigsaw, you can grab a game, you can check out an escape room, pick up a crossword, join me in my <laughs> daily wordle. Whatever works to get your mind off drinking is going to help you through more minutes, more hours, more days, and more months of not drinking. I'm, I'm being careful with this one as I say this because Heather Clark is my editor for the show <laughs> and she is a decluttering expert. But I'm also going to tell you, and I, I don't mind saying it out loud, that for some of you, cleaning and decluttering, it is a gigantic pain in the ass. But man, sometimes it does bring such satisfaction. So you want to pick a drawer, pick a closet, pick a corner, pick a countertop, pick your car, pick anything, and bring it to something that feels good, clean, and new. Then pick something else. And if this whole idea of cleaning and decluttering feels like something that would drive you to drink, obviously skip it. But my observation for a lot of people is that my clients who are struggling with holding on to clutter and disorganization in their lives, it is a maladaptive coping strategy for their trauma. We're actually going to be talking more about this next week. So if you've been struggling with clutter and disorganization in your life, stay tuned. Heather and I have actually got you. She's joining in on that episode with me. But to continue with our coping strategies for today, I want you also to start thinking about decisions you make as a coping strategy, and I want you to think of maybe plans you've been avoiding making. I First, I told you to do chores, and now I'm telling you to make decisions. This might start to feel like I'm kicking you while you're down and giving you even more work to do, but a lot of people, I got to tell you, are triggered to drink because they're avoiding dealing with things. So they're skipping conflicts, they're dodging those hard conversations. And kicking the can down the road feels like the solution in the moment. And you might be seeing now how it's only created a bigger problem for you. So get honest with yourself. What have you been avoiding? What needs to get addressed? Where can you stop the buck? Use your therapist, use your friends, use your group, use whatever you need and get whatever support you need but start checking those things off the list so they can stop following you and dogging you while you're trying to get well. Anything that's getting in the way of your wellness is a threat to your sobriety, so let's just take care of it once and for all. I'm also wondering here, is gratitude your thing? I gotta be honest with you here. Again, it's not always mine, but research really does back up this idea pretty well too. I'm not really any good at offering a solid gratitude practice, but if you have one that works for you, let it work for you and use it. If you don't have a practice, I haven't turned you off with my kind of snarky comments about it. If the idea makes you curious and you want to learn more, go ahead and search for it. Learn more. There's so many options out there. Don't be shy about using them. And remember what I said, and I've been saying, anything that you have buy-in into that feels healthier than drinking is going to be the thing that works for you. I would also check in on your use of social media right about now, and I would make sure that your social is working for you. Make sure you're only following the social media accounts that make you feel good Make sure they're offering you a healthy distraction as opposed to a distraction that's making you want to drink more. Make sure the people in the accounts and the, the people you follow, that they are supporting the kind of life you want to be living. I intentionally follow a lot of artisans because I love looking at a social media feed that's filled with pottery and color and pretty things. Whatever you were hoping for when you turn on social, Seek out more of that. You're going to want to unfriend, unfollow, or block anyone that fails to protect your peace or sobriety on social. And <laughs> lastly, I was just talking in session about this last week with someone who thanked me for this. But you're going to want to remember that it's okay to laugh and it's okay to find humor in the hard. 
You want to welcome in any moment of levity that finds you. Seek out the moments of levity. Share them. It is totally okay to laugh about it. I laugh at narcissists all the time, and I know I have to be careful because I don't want any of you to experience me as minimizing your trauma or making light of your experience, but sometimes, man, this shit is funny, and it is okay to laugh. I highly recommend it. All right, friends, this episode was a beast. Holy cow, it took me forever to outline, it took me (laughs) forever to work through the attachment, and it took me some time to record. I think you're hearing my voice kind of go a little bit at the end. So thanks for sticking with me in this. As a reminder, I do have that document. It's going to be that guide. I'm going to link to it for you in the show notes. Dorothy, holy heck, woman, you really asked a hard question, and I Really, truly, truly, truly hope that my answer has been worthy of your bravery. I hope you're going to find in this a frame for how you want to approach it and how you want to see it. And I hope you see how serious I took it. And I hope you see this as proof that I really do believe you're not alone. So many women listening are managing their own struggles with alcohol as they also try to make sense and from and recover from their mother wounds. You have all been doing the absolute very best you've been able to do with the tools you have at the time. I really, honestly, truly believe that. You have all been doing your best. And hopefully with the tools that I'm offering today, you're going to find a few more that you can add to your toolkit so you can achieve the wellness and the mental strength you're seeking. Thank you so much to all of you for sending Dorothy good vibes, for sending out good wishes to all of the women who share in the struggle. Be sure to save some of those good thoughts for yourselves too. And next week, as I hinted at earlier, we are talking about decluttering and getting rid of the shit that's been bogging you down. My partner in crime for the show is Heather Clark, and when she isn't helping me with the show, she's running her own business at Home and Office Detox. She's built a business helping people see the connection between the emotional shit they're carrying and the emotional shit they're storing, and she's going to be helping all of you start the process of getting rid of it. She's in it with you. I'm in it with you. And you have always got each other. This shared community of wounded daughters trying to find your way together. How incredibly beautiful. Until next time, bye for now. I'm so grateful that you're here. You're right where you're supposed to be. At its heart, I'm hoping to use this show to build a community of women working together to heal from childhoods marked by maternal narcissism and emotional neglect. My goal for Mother Mayhem is that this show becomes an advice and mentoring-driven show where you share your questions, struggles, and stories, and I offer you direction for healing and recovery. That can't happen without your contributions. I invite you to send a recorded voice memo or write in an email with your questions and things you're struggling with. You can always find me over at heather at daughtersnpd.com. To connect further, I invite you to find me over at Instagram and occasionally on TikTok at daughtersnpd. If you know another woman who needs this conversation in her life, I'm going to ask that you share the show with her. You can help me get the word out with your reviews and social shares of the show, and I hope you'll consider doing so. Special thanks to Heather Clark for editing this show. She's in my head and knows what I meant to say when the words come out backwards. Thanks for your time today. I'm always in it with you. Bye for now.